Hey everyone, Brian Zane here with my review of AEW Dynamite for Wednesday, August 10th, 2022. It's Quake by the Lake Edition in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Should be a good one on tap here with the matches they've announced for the show. And uh, we begin with a coffin match as Brody King takes on Darby Allen. Uh, the match begins pretty quickly here as Brody's making his entrance. Darby jumps him midway through that. And the match begins. We've got a skateboard covered in thumbtacks that Darby immediately uses as a weapon and Brody's bleeding pretty quickly. The blood over the war paint he's wearing, I gotta say, for lack of a better phrase, it's metal as fuck. I loved it, but he bled a lot in this matchup here and pretty early going as well. So a lot of blood in this thing, uh, physical to say the least for, for both these guys and continuing the chemistry they have where Darby does such a good job selling for Brody throughout. Brody spends all the commercial breaks setting up a table, it seems, only for him to finally jump off the top rope, try and dive onto Darby, but Darby moves, so he splats the table on the floor. The lights cut out and the rest of the House of Black teleport in, and sure enough, all the members work together to beat up Darby for a while as a We Want Sting chant fills the arena. Sure enough, Buddy Matthews goes to open the coffin at ringside and Sting pops out, which is amazing. I just love, there needs to be like a, a, a compilation or a countdown of Sting's greatest just like surprise reveals, like showing up under the curtain when uh, Seth Rollins is going to get a statue unveiled or him wearing a mask of his own face over his face in the crowd or something. There needs to be a list of that. And this is another great one here. He just pops out in the casket. He's got like part of his face paint is like messed up because of the black mist that hit him a while ago. And uh, he challenges Malachi Black, throws the bat into his lap and he wants him to fight. But Malachi wants no part of it, drops the bat, goes up the ramp. Sting follows him. The match continues here with Brody and Darby. Darby ends up choking Brody out with Brody's own chain and the way it's positioned Brody just like passes out and falls like rolls right into the coffin and as he bumps into it casket closes you couldn't ask for a better like landing into the coffin and for just to close so perfectly what a great finish there very fun physical match here Darby winning here great opening match we see the full bracket for the trios championship tournament to conclude at all out and then we see John Moxley cutting a promo backstage where he talks about he wants to call the AEW interim world championship championship the FYI title and I had to go did I hear that right did he say FYI title and I looked it up on Twitter and what people were saying FYI I think it was meant to stand for fuck your interim I believe is what the initials are there hey it's a lot catchier than GFY he tells Jericho that if he can't make him break his fighting spirit then he will break his body by the end of the match here then after the commercial break we hear from Chris Jericho where he talks about after two and a half years he's going to correct a big injustice and beat Moxley to regain the championship he talks about how Stu Hart was not some kind Kind, sweet old man. He was a sadist and who brought so much stuff and just punishment to Jericho. He never wanted to think about it again until tonight. And he says he will stretch the shit out of Moxley and he guarantees a victory and win of the championship here. A tornado tag team match with good Lucha things aplenty as the Lucha brothers take on Roosh and Andrade El Idolo. Uh, Penta is wearing his old gear here. They make a point of that in commentary. He's not Penta Oscuro tonight. He's gone back to his Lucha roots as he takes on some old rivals here. Uh, uh, getting violent uh, during the commercial break here. At one point, you've got like Roosh choking out Phoenix with a camera cable, while at the same time, Andrade drops Penta onto a chair on the floor. The heels hit a double dive. Phoenix gets on a big run here, flying hither and yon. Then eventually, he and Penta respond with a double dive of their own. Uh, Penta with a great destroyer onto the apron at one point. Though a moment later, Penta's mask gets tied to the rope and he's stuck. He has to unmask himself in order to break up a pinfall at one point, and uh, they try and throw a spare mask in, but the baddies intercept it, throw it out in the crowd. A hammerlock DDT on a defenseless Phoenix for Rouge and Andrade to win. I thought it was a good matchup here. I like Tornado matches just because of the frenetic pace of them all. Also, torna also Tornado is a way better game mode to play uh, in a wrestling video game, for example, than, say, one with tags, in my opinion. I think we're seeing a lot in not just AEW, but WWE as well, where it's like there's all this mask removal. Like, Rey Mysterio gets his mask taken off him like every other month, it feels like, or every other rivalry it happens. And I feel like we're seeing that a lot here. I know it's part of the storyline with Roosh and Andrade at the moment,
moment, but it just feels like, it, you know, the, the mask used to mean something, I feel, but like now it's just been done, and it's not a recent thing. It just feels like the mask has been overused as a plot device where it's like, oh my god, I can't believe we did that. It's like, it happens all the time. They should get better chin straps for their masks, clearly. We see backstage the Young Bucks approach Hangman and Paige, who's hanging out with the Dark Order, and uh, Matt gives a very passionate speech of apology to Hangman here, talking about how, you know, the fame and fortune went to their heads and made them weird, and how they wish they could take everything back that had happened between, you know, they and Paige, and how some of the best moments of their careers and lives were with when they were all together. And so, basically, he puts over, also puts over Paige's winning the world championship in that same building, uh, and also says, hey, let's reunite the Hung Bucks, you know, the three of us for the trios tournament, let's, let's tear it down. And the fans definitely react like they want to see this, for sure. They want to see the Hung Bucks reunite night, but Paige lets them down kind of gently and says he's going to be in the Dark Order's corner as they are in the Trios tournament, so he can't be teaming with the Bucks here. So, kind of lets him down easy there, and uh, kind of sad, kind of bittersweet. We'll get that reunion soon enough, I'm sure. It's just not going to be happening at the Trios tournament. So, yeah, obviously still the concern of who the third man will be in the Bucks team. Who do you think it's going to be? My money's still on Kenny Omega. It feels kind of like simultaneously a safe bet and also a long shot, because it feels like based on how today Today's show ends to, to follow up the next week with a Kenny Omega return, I think would be a little too much. But that's just my thought on it. Like, you know, I'm still kind of 50 50 on my thoughts about that, but what do you think? Jungle Boy joins the commentary team for our next match as Luchasaurus takes on and quickly destroys Anthony Henry of the Work Horseman. It was a squiggity squash match. Not much to say about it. He wins with the fossilizer, I believe is the word they, they called that move. Christian K shows up on the screen to talk some smack, but Jungle Boy leaves the commentary table and runs to the back to try and confront him. They're about to fight, but security breaks it up. And Lin, uh, Christian runs off. Luchasaurus headbutts Pat Buck. It's mad. It's pandemonium, but it just feels, you know, kind of like a continuation of what they're already doing. It's a great storyline. You know, it's been that way, but we're just getting just kind of another lateral chapter in that story. Mira is sitting in a dark room looking for guidance and then Julia Hart approaches him and basically offers him a spot in the House of Black but Mira with a great line saying only one woman is allowed to touch me and you are not her and he realizes that his path must go through destroying the House of Black so so saith the word of the Redeemer and then we see powerhouse Hobbs uh, be about to be interviewed backstage what the relationship is with he and Ricky Starks as if you needed a clarifier on that from what we saw in the breakup but then we see the factory and QT Marshall show up and QT basically says they're going to take care of Starks tonight for for Powerhouse but Hobbs tells them not to become his problem. Hmm. Jay Lethal and crew are well dressed and make their way to the ring. They put over what they did to Wardlow at Battle of the Belts this past Saturday and Jay basically asking for another shot at the belt or whether they're just going to take the belt from, from Wardlow here. But Wardlow answers the challenge. He's raring to go. Suddenly FTR show up and even the odds they have a scuffle and then you've got the good guys standing tall. It sure feels like a six-man tag is inevitable based on this booking, but will Sanjay keep having these like spot matches? I know he had a match a week or two ago on Rampage in a tag with Orange Cassidy where he didn't have to do much. Like, is that just going to be his thing where every few weeks he's brought out to wrestle, but not really because, you know, he's talked in interviews how he doesn't really want to get back into wrestling full-time. Like, his neck's not, his, his body's not the way it was. So, I can't imagine they're going to keep him doing this. So, who would the other third man possibly be for a six-man of this magnitude. We hear from the Jericho Appreciation Society and they are just giddy. They are practically bouncing off the walls with excitement over the uh, prospect of Chris Jericho winning the main event and regaining the world championship. They say there's a little bit of the bubbly on standby backstage in their dressing room and uh, Daniel Garcia reiterates he's the dragon slayer and he says that Brian Danielson should be thanking him for putting him on another paid vacation to be with his family and his garden. And so yeah, he says he's the dragon slayer. He, re he reiterates that point. And then uh, like the last couple of JAS promos we've been seeing lately, the, the exclamation point is Anna J snapping and threatening to choke people out, and then immediately doing so with another stage hand. Former tag team partners in the indie scene collide here on a bigger stage as Aaron Solo of the Factory takes on Ricky Starks. Uh, Cole Carter of the Factory early in this match interferes, but nothing really comes of it. Ricky's able to shrug that off pretty quickly. It's a short and sweet match. Starks ends up winning with a big old spear. Solo's bump was pretty impressive on that one. Then after the match, you got Nick Camarado wearing a very slick velour sweatsuit, I might add. He runs in, he comes to the ring. Ricky spinebusters him for his efforts. So I thought that was a very impressive visual. Starks 
escapes the mob of the factory and celebrates in the crowd. And we cut to the uh, the backstage area where Hobbs is breaking equipment because he's so frustrated that you know the factory couldn't get the job done. So yeah, bad look for the factory. But hey, that's why I put them on the you know the jobbers table video a few weeks ago. Uh, you know, it's just more build for Starks and Hobbs. Like I said, it feels like it's just a nice kind of like a smaller step in that direction. But yeah, Starks is looking good, and the fans definitely still behind him here. We hear from the Gun Club backstage. Billy is chastising his sons for losing the dumpster match last week. In Billy's words, the one match I made famous, he says. He's, he's mad about that. He says, this is why I missed the acclaim. We used to have fun. But then Stokely Hathaway shows up and he calls Billy Grandpa Ass and says, oh, you should be in bed because it's past 8 o'clock. A lot of old person jokes, but he's, he's offering his card to the boys, but Billy stops that in its tracks. So he says, so Stokely runs away and Billy says, I got you a match this Friday on Rampage and we find out it's going to be against Danhausen and Eric Redbeard, the former Rowan in WWE, so it's going to be Beardhausen going against uh, Billy and or Austin and Colton Gunn, I should say. So Danhausen and Redbeard, that should be a very interesting combination. Then elsewhere backstage, Shivani's interviewing Orange Cassidy and the Best Friends are doing some new high five routine when they're interrupted by the Trust Busters. That's Arya Davari, Parker Bradeau, and Slim J, who I'm not familiar with at all with their work, but uh, so I'll have to be I'll have to wait and see what they're about. But th I'm not even really familiar with the Trust Busters. It's brand new to me as of tonight watching this, but Davari offers Orange a chance to, to join the group, but you got to ditch those losers to the best friends. Orange says no, and so Davari basically vows revenge at some point. On we go to the TBS Championship match as Jade Cargill takes on newcomer Madison Rain. Well, newcomer to AEW, I should say. Of course, longtime veteran in wrestling, really made her name in Impact Wrestling, and uh, she's the new coach for the women's division. So uh, this is her second televised match for AEW, and it's a pretty good one here. Kiara Hogan has a little distraction before the break that allows Jade to take over. Rain comes back. She tricks Jade into kicking Kiara off the apron at one point. Madison putting up a good fight, but ultimately she falls to Jaded. And then after the match, Athena shows up and jumps Jade. And that's where that ends, just chasing her out of the ring. I thought the match was a good showcase for both ladies. I mean, Jade looked pretty good here. And Madison showing that, you know, she could do a good job, you know, working with somebody uh, far less experienced than her. I think that the commentary did a really good job, like really building the story of building the character of Madison Rain in a relatively short amount of time, explaining why we should care about her instead of just dropping her in. So they did a good job putting some respect on her name. Backstage, Tony Schiavone is with Thunderstorm. There's an update that Chris Statlander has been hurt once again. So now Tony Storm is the new number one contender to Thunder Rose's Women's Championship. So kind of an awkward exchange with these two where they kind of go, well, that's unfortunate about Chris. It's just the way it is. But hey, now we've got this you know, possible match coming up, and so we're still going to be friends, but it's just kind of awkward now. But let's talk about that title match later, they say. We get a big plug for Rampage this Friday, and then in our main event for the AEW FYI Championship, let's call it that for right now, at least for this very second, John Moxley defends against Lionheart, Chris Jericho. He comes out to White Zombie. He comes out in the old uh, trunks. And the old tights, I should say, and the vest. Even his hair was reminiscent of his of his younger self there. So I thought it was cool to see that kind of throwback and to see it resonate well with the crowd. I'm pretty sure that Lionheart graphic they used was the same one they used at Double or Nothing 2019 when Jericho's entrance had like the different Jericho stand-ins throughout the ages and stuff. And I'm pretty sure it's the same Lionheart graphic there. But this is a good match here. Good back and forth. Jericho ripping Moxley's earring out of his ear, which you know what? It's another day ending in Y, so of course Moxley's going to bleed like crazy in this matchup, bleeding all over from the ear. It's really gross. Jericho with a figure four around the ring post at one point. We get a cross face countered into a Walls of Jericho, which is not an authentic Lionheart move. No, no. It's the Lion Tamer. Get your shit right. Moxley's in the hold for the entire length of the commercial break. That was really impressive. He's sitting there for the entire three minutes fighting out of it, uh, and he gets a rope break when they come out of commercial. Moxley dives off the top rope to the outside. Jericho catches him in midair with a code breaker a few minutes later. At one point, Guevara throws an item toward Jericho, but the pass is incomplete. Jericho has to like run out to like get the weapon, deck uh, Moxley with it, and we get a kick out. And then finally, Jericho does get the lion tamer locked in. Jericho is bleeding now, 
by the way, because he was thrown face first into an exposed turnbuckle. So Bloody Jericho gets the Lion Tamer on Bloody Moxley, and then Moxley counters it into a rear naked choke. Jericho taps, Moxley wins and retains the championship. Really, really good match here with these two. I thought these guys definitely brought, they have very good chemistry. Then after the match, you got the Jericho Appreciation Society and the Blackpool Combat Club and Friends with a big old brawl, and uh, Jericho's group's on top. Jericho wants to lay out Moxley with the belt, but then here comes CM Punk. We have not seen him in many a week since his injury, and uh, he's still the world champion officially, so he helps clean house, helps make the save. We get that face off with the world champion and the interim FYI champion, and that was a cool moment. The fans were definitely alive for that one, and the cool shot of Moxie, just his bloody ear as the stare down. Like no, no intimidation, no trepidation on the part of Moxley here. And then uh, Moxley just kind of like walks past him, goes on, and Punk soaks in the crowd as the show wraps up. Like I said, the match itself was good. I think Jericho did a good job, you know, um, you know, pulling off the Lion Tamer look and or Lion Heart look, and it was, yeah, just kind of, a, kind of a fun little throwback. I'm glad the fans appreciated that. Good segment at the end. Punk's return, I think, is huge now that he's hopefully coming back, and that inevitable unification match, uh, maybe as early as All Out, who knows, but whenever it happens, that's going to be big for sure. My grade for this week's Dynamite, Quake by the Lake version, I should say, is a B-. minus. I thought this was a pretty darn solid show overall. Um, only a couple of things I didn't like, like some of the, some of the squash matches. There was, you know, a couple, you know, one too many for me for those quick squash matches. I think there was a bit too much blood on this show. It's like they're doing the blood every week, and it's the point where it's just kind of people are desensitized to it. It doesn't mean anything. Um, if you're going to have Moxley bleed every show, he should be the only one who gets to bleed. Like, sorry, Brody King bleeding over his war paint was badass, but I think that that much blood for the opening of the show and to have some more blood afterward, I think that takes away from both uh, both circumstances, honestly. But besides that, the matches, like the opening match, the ending match, were really great. And CM Punk's return, I think, was a cool thing to see. Uh, you know, I'm going to probably talk about it a little more in This Week in Regret, but between what, you know, WWE is doing and who they're bringing up and bringing back, and, you know, that I think that could hopefully lead to some more big counter moves by AEW here, so time will tell. But those are just my thoughts, folks. You know, there was good storytelling, especially with the matches that were given time on the show. I think there was also a big bunch of promos on, on the episode as well, and many of which also did a good job kind of moving the plot along and some storyline development as well. What did you all think of Dynamite this week, folks? I want to hear about it in the comments section below. Stay tuned for this weekend when my Nashville vlog drops. You'll see my footage from StarCast and backstage at Ric Flair's last match and me interviewing Soraya. It's going to be a good old time. I can't wait for you to see it. But until then, I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.